Hey Tom, how you doing, sir? Uh, not too bad today, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. not too bad today. Yeah. Um, tell me a bit about yourself, please, Tom. Um, I'm 24, from uh, Coventry. Uh, I'm a sports coach and PE teacher. I've been doing that since I was 18. I've been working with children since I was 16 when I left school. I went through uh, college and then uh, found a job in uh, sports coaching, PE teaching, etc. And I've been doing that since. Um, I've struggled with mental health issues since about the age of 13. So I'm 24 now. So that's 11 years ago that they all started. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's a very long time for me. Mm, it has been but a the, long time. Yeah. And the thing was at that age, um, I didn't know what mental health was. I didn't know what depression meant. I didn't know what anxiety was. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I was not clued up on it at all. I had no idea what I was going through. I used to get counseling at school and then they referred me to the Minds charity because I was too strong for what the school could offer. Right. And I, I used understand. to have to go and speak to someone from mind every monday in like a group session kind of thing mm. uh i've got a certificate at the end of all of that but nothing ever really changed it's always been present for the past 11 years now with me it's okay. a daily battle daily daily battle every day wow so okay before we start do you have a pen and paper with you by any chance no no okay is, can you get one or is it gonna take a bit too long It'll probably take a bit too long, yeah. Okay, okay. All right. Um, all right. So let's start with this. I'm going to write it out. I've got my paper right here, by the way. So if you see me looking down, it's just that I'm writing notes, yeah? Yep. Okay, cool. All right, so let's go back. Um, let's go back as far as you can. And tell me about the first time you kind of like encountered like you said mental you you going through some form of mental trauma or mental challenge at that time um yeah. tell me about the first time you were going through a trauma what what happened then um, what age were you early as i can remember mm -hmm. uh there was trauma in my life uh i'm not going to pinpoint what it was uh but when I started to realize the effects of it was when I was 13, um, moods had become extremely low. Uh, shaking in my hands, fidgeting, um, uncontrollable crying. Some nights it would, the crying would last three hours. The worthlessness, feeling unwanted. There was a lot of hopelessness towards me. Self-hate. And if um, something bad would happen to me, I would self-destruct. I would blame myself um, and start to bring harm to myself, really, because that was the only way, even now as a 24-year-old man, it's the only way I know how to deal with things, really, that happen to me. Okay. And so what age... The thing, whatever that thing is, um, obviously, you know, I don't know, we don't know, uh, just yourself. What age did that particular thing happen? Um, from about the age of five, right up until 14, basically. Okay, five until 14. Yeah. Can you tell me about we're not going to talk about that particular thing it's up to you you share what you can handle um, yeah tell me about how you tell me about your feelings when you was five what was you feeling so if you, if you could give me yeah, if you could time. give me one word per feeling so you like scared this that like if you can tell me what was it what was the feelings you was experiencing so one of them one of them you said scared yeah yeah, there was isolation. Um, fear comes with the scared as well. Uh, there was a lot of dread as well, like going to school, coming out of my bedroom, being around people. There was a lot of dread about everything that I had to do. 
something like and you said isolation yeah yeah there would i would isolate myself away from people uh which i still have done now mm-hmm. and so i'm going to go through each one with you and normally i would ask why but in this case i you know it's not something you're prepared to share at this time um and so normally i would ask how was you feeling which i just asked so now the second thing i would normally ask is why so we can get down to it um so i'm going to try and approach it from a different angle so you were scared what was going on in your mind at that time when when you were scared what what was your self conversation it was just as a child it, it was i wasn't old enough or clued up enough to think uh maturely mm-hmm. um but i had to grow up from a very young age like mm-hmm. i had to have more mature feelings from a very young age and it was survival mode a lot of the time mm-hmm. for me that's what it was it was constant survival mode as a child um and as someone that works with children i know that they grow off uh positivity and praise whereas i was surrounded by a lot of negativity mm-hmm. and people knocking me down basically all the time mm-hmm. so yeah it transcends into adult life when that's what you grow up with because it's all you know it's what you've been taught as a younger and obviously I brought it into adult life which is a uh, once I'm discharged from the crisis ward that I'm on now is what has to be trained out of me like my brain rewired etc yes okay and so we're going to get to that shortly so you're on a crisis ward at the moment yeah okay and so one of them was scared the other one was fear tell mm. me about the fear that you was experiencing at that time um, I received a lot of like, bullying at school, within primary and secondary school. Uh, it would be physical, verbal, differed a lot of the time. Um, and like I say, when it comes with the dread, that is what I would dread going to school, being around. And that came with the isolation, the bullying. Right. And so, Didn't... so would would we also say that the dread was was also anxiety? You was getting really anxious. Yeah, yeah, but simple things like schools, uh, PE. As a PE teacher now, believe it or not, I used to get really anxious about doing PE. I never wanted to do it. Um, I used to get nervous about lessons that would, say, be out of the usual routine. Um, Yeah, like I had to have continuity and consistency because if I broke out of that, I would become fearful, scared, um, because I was always constantly worried about what people were going to do or what they'd think of me. Right. From a young age. mm -hmm. How did you deal with it? Or what did you try to do to deal with it? Was it just the isolation? You just used to hide yourself away? Or did you have tools to try and deal with it? What what was it that you was doing on a daily basis that... um, as a coping mechanism, what did you try to do at that time? Um, when I was a young child, I just sort of had to do it. Like in primary school settings, it was like, well, you've got no choice. You've got to do it. Um, so I would self-destruct when I would go to bed at night, uh, cry, be fearful, scared. I wouldn't go to sleep. I'd put off going to sleep so the next day didn't come. Um, and then as I came over to a teenager, uh, I had coping mechanisms like self-harm. If I would self-harm, it would take me away from my thoughts and my feelings as it was like a focus. Um, so I used to yeah, self-harm very regularly as a teenager to just escape, really. It was the only way I knew how to deal with things. Mm. For many people, they don't understand self-harm um let, let's try and look at that together for a second and we're, we're going to go back is it that the, your, the self-conversation in your mind was so loud about what was going on that the self-harm was a, a release from the 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 shouting and screaming and the playback in your mind is that correct or is it was it something else 
Uh, it's that, and then it was something else as well. Like, yeah. if I was having a hard time, the self harm would be a bit of a release. So, like you say, get them emotions out. Mm-hmm. It would take my mind off how I was thinking or feeling. And then, if something was going wrong, or if it was something that would hurt me emotionally, or like some something was going on at home where it would upset people, I would blame myself. Mm. And then it would be first initial reaction would be self destruction, bring yourself harm, hurt yourself, blame yourself because it's your fault. Even if it wasn't my fault at all, it would be yeah. it's your fault. You've got to hurt and pay for that. That was what would go on in my mind. Yeah. So it was a range of things why I did it really. Mm. Mm-hmm. I understand. And so what used to happen is you used to go in a pattern and it yeah. used to be a, a rotation of, of emotions that you'll go through. And with those emotions, there was a self-conversation as well. Yeah. And so you will tell yourself you're not worthy, you're not good enough. Um, why am I here? And with yeah. that, the emotions came, the anger came, the frustration came, the worthlessness came. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've named a lot of things that I felt and still do feel then, like worthlessness, there was a lot of hopelessness about me as a teenager as well. I felt hopeless. I never felt wanted, loved, anything. It was just... It was always, I always felt as a teenager like the world would be better without me in it. I always thought that. So I was constantly battling suicidal thoughts all the time. Yeah. Um, it was... I would constantly be telling myself, I don't want to be here. Just every day it would be, I don't want to be here, I want to die. Um... And as a teenager, you don't know how to regulate that because from a child up to a teenager in primary, secondary school, there was no education on mental health. There was nothing. No. There was no, not even an hour's lesson just to upskill people briefly on what it was. I had no idea what it was. I thought it was normal then because it was something that I'd always experienced. It was just normality to me. Yeah. I never, I never questioned it, if that makes sense. I never thought to seek proper help because it's all I knew so I thought it was normality and of course it's not as I've grown older now I fully understand mental health Um, but back then I had no idea I used to look at celebrities that would suffer and think oh why are they suffering they've got loads of money they're wealthy they're well off what on earth have they got to feel bad about that Mm. was how uneducated I was on it even though I was suffering Mm. so I always yeah so i always think now that children from a young age need to be educated on it that's my opinion anyway so you said five months up until the age of 13 what happened at 13 where there was a change or um you, yeah at 13 was when the self-harm started um that was when the suicidal thoughts began i think as my mind was developing and I was developing uh yeah I would run out of home a lot of the time uh I would sit in my room and think I want to die I don't want to be here then the self-harm would start as a way of stopping those thoughts um I never planned like people that are suicidal can make plans to end their life I never planned it it was just repetitive in my head and telling myself don't want to be here want to die constantly um i was never clued up enough on how to end my life back then i think that's what kept me alive really just not having the education on how to take it uh because at school i struggled terribly i was i couldn't engage in lessons because i was so withdrawn all the time and my grades suffered because of that Mm. (laughs) So, how how would you love to feel? What would be your ideal feelings? Happiness. Okay. Um, so in I'm current write mind, this down for you. Happiness. Yeah. Um, to feel wanted. Um, to feel like I have a purpose and feel like I have hope. Hope. Oh, brilliant. Purpose. Because. Brilliant. Yeah. Because right now. All of that is pretty void for me. Okay. And so I'm going to ask you something. Um, What does happiness look like to you? 
See, I was having this debate with myself about a week ago, mm -hmm. um, and I spoke with the crisis team about this. I said, I don't know what it is. I can't identify it. I said to them, I said, I can't remember the last time I was happy, the last day I had that I can say that was good. Um, I just have no idea how to be happy, feel happy, or even, I just have no idea what it is at all. Okay, okay, that, that's fine, that's fine. We'll, we'll find that, we'll find that. And when you say wanted, what does wanted look like to you? Um, like when I say, I feel like the world would be better without me in it. Uh, people would have it easier. People would be better off mm. to feel wanted. So to feel like not feel that basically to feel as though people would be okay with me being around and like, I'm not a burden to people with the way that I'm feeling. Okay. So. Let's go. I, I'd like to look at that. Let's let's challenge that together. Let's challenge it. Let's look at when you say the world will be better off without you. Let's. I'm gonna ask you this first. What harm have you done to the world? Do you believe? Can't pinpoint that at all. Because you haven't harmed the world. No. Can't pinpoint that. No. Okay. Who have you destroyed? Um, obviously, I've upset people, but not but destroyed them. we've all upset them. people. Every yeah, single yeah, one of us. Yeah, not not destroyed them, no. Okay. No. Um, so would you accept that up upsetting people is normal? We've all done it. There's not one person on this planet that hasn't upset someone before. Yeah, I can I can agree with that. Every, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Yeah. Um. I've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, like I say, upset people, but I guess everybody does that. I haven't ever destroyed anyone okay. at all. So, would you agree that the world wouldn't be better off without you because you haven't done no harm to anyone within the world or you haven't done no harm to the world itself? I think that comes with a sense of that like I'm a burden to people yes like my mental health issues for some people have been too much yes and they've uh dragged people down or affected people negatively because mm -hmm. for a long time i haven't been able to regulate it or have any control over it mm -hmm. um so that's where that feeling comes from like yeah. oh well if i'm not here then it's not my mental health isn't affecting them so okay. it's easier for them okay so let's once again let's challenge that because i knew you was going to get to the burden part Let's challenge that. Okay, so I want you to pinpoint someone who loves you and you love them, okay? Yeah. And so you've got a neutral connection of, of understanding of, of how you feel about each other, yeah? Yeah. And I want you to not think about it from an emotional perspective for a second. Let's talk about it from a logical perspective, okay? Because emotions, it can send us all over the place, all right? And yeah. we'll talk about that shortly. Logically, if that person could never hug you again, never say hello to you again, never see you again, how do you think that person would feel? That one person who you're thinking about? It would probably devastate them because it was only a couple of weeks ago they were saying to me that I just want you to live. Okay. And uh, they were getting upset. Um, yeah, it would, it would have a pretty... Yeah, it would have a bad negative impact on their life. It and would, you think definitely. their life will be changed forever? Yeah, because we've been best friends now for as long as I can remember. Okay. Uh, and uh, he's that one person in life that I've always gone to without hesitation and will tell anything without hesitation. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there is certain things that no one in this world knows that only he knows. Mm -hmm. And it's the same both ways, really. Yeah. Yeah. And so, would you say it's fair enough to say that the world wouldn't be better off without you? Your world wouldn't be better off without you because that particular person 
they they will lose someone so precious to them that it will probably break them so if you was to choose logically if i wasn't here or if i was here that person would be better off what one would you choose logically to be here to be here logically yeah okay to be here okay yeah okay yeah Let, let's talk about your mind for a second I've, I, I always say this to people our minds are not big fans of us sounds really crazy yeah but our mind is not a big fan of us yeah all our mind wants is an experience that's what our mind wants an experience this is why you see people self-harm as you said uh, people bungee jump people get on crazy roller coaster rides people skydive people climb mountains because the mind is seeking an experience and it doesn't yeah. care what happens to the body in the process of seeking an experience and so you've got two sides of you you've got your spiritual side your spiritual side wants you to be here your spiritual side is very very protective over you it doesn't even like when you do certain things like bungee jump or skydive because it realizes how fragile the body is where the mind on the other hand the mind just wants an experience it doesn't kind of care about the consequences it's got a mindset of or the mindset has got a mindset of of um we'll deal with it later you know we'll deal with it later and this is how mm. people get into trouble most of the time you know it's like let me steal that thing well what's, what if i get caught you won't get caught we'll deal with that later then they get caught and then it's like okay run and it's like you're running now and then there's a side of you says no just stop and let's just give up and hand ourselves over and it's like no 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 no. climb that fence well that fence is a bit high and if we fall and all of a sudden your mind is going from one experience to another when there's another side of you saying i don't want to do this and so mm. what we need to do is lessen the mind and heighten the spiritual self conversation does that make sense at all yeah it does yeah massively yeah, yeah. massively brilliant and so that's what we need to work on is is the self conversation of the mind and the spiritual conversation with the self okay mm -hmm. and then we're going to get back to some of this because there's a lot here and you know we can definitely find solutions there's four stages of happiness and there's four stages of success but there's also four stages of failure there's four stages okay mm -hmm. um stage number one is your belief system what do you believe i would love for you to have a pen right now how long would it take you to get a pen and paper if you can oh um i'm not too sure uh there's paper it's just knowing where a pen is in the house <laughs> oh wow i would love for you because writing this down is very 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 important okay um, yeah go on i'll wait because this is important don't worry about it okay i can pause and stuff it's fine right yep yep we're good yeah brilliant okay so as i said there's four stages of success but there's also four stages of failure yeah yeah stage number one is our belief system what do we believe do we believe we're not good enough do we believe we're not worthy do we believe um we shouldn't be here do we believe what what is our belief system so that's stage one uh, what we believe okay yeah and so we're made out of atoms okay i don't want to get too too um scientific and stuff but we're made out of atoms okay have you ever heard yeah. anyone say that to you before no okay cool we're made out of atoms and inside of an atom is protons a proton is a positive charge yeah electrons yeah. electron is a negative charge and a neutron is like a dimmer switch so everything on this planet is made out of atoms okay yeah so when you're going through a negative time in your life you're going through an electron zone when you're going through a positive time you're going through a proton zone and then yeah. in, and in between you may swing in between which is a neutron zone it's like a dimmer switch you know you switch on a light it's not quite bright and it's not quite switched off it's a dimmer switch and so that's what we're made out of so what right now what you're talking to me about is that you're, you're talking about an electron zone okay but but thank god you are also a proton zone 
you're made out of all of the elements so you can get to that happy place that you're talking about so let me go back to it your belief system so at the moment your belief system and what your belief system has been is that um you don't feel like you're you're worth being on this planet you don't feel good enough you don't feel worthy you don't feel like you know you're loved and all these other emotions that you're you've got going on and self conversations you've got going on that's your belief system okay that's what you believe about yourself from what you've said to me and so what happens with that it goes on to stage two stage two if you can write this down so stage one is your belief system stage yeah. two is the meaning you give to things so because you believe you're not good enough the meaning you give to things are very negative so they say tom you're such a great guy and in your mind you're like i'm not a great guy because i'm i'm a burden to you and yeah. so because your belief system is that you are all of those things we've just spoken about the meaning you give to things which is stage two is a negative self-conversation so this is the self-conversations you're having the meaning just means your self-conversation the meaning you give to things is negative okay and yeah. which leads to stage three stage three is action so when you have a negative uh, belief system the meaning you give to things is negative and so the actions you take will be negative so the negative would be for example self-harm okay yeah and when you self-harm with it which is the action it leads on to the final stage which is stage four which is results so then the result would turn out to be a negative you see the cut you you, you feel bad and so i don't want to even put that in your mouth um how do you feel once you was finishing self-harm you know you've done something that you class as not a good idea destructive whatever it may be um what happens to me is i'll go into something like a trance if that makes sense yes um it's a very tunnel vision state of mind where everything around me all the support that is available to me um distractions i wouldn't even i would totally forget that they're there it's almost like they don't exist to me Mm -hmm. um i get very set on what i want to do um and then i do it so say for like self-harm for example and then when i break out of that i snap out of that trance i snap out of that tunnel vision Mm -hmm. and a lot of the time after i've thought what the hell have i been doing Mm. i think what are you doing that is that is like um that is ridiculous you shouldn't be doing that and then i feel bad for doing it um i feel a lot of regret towards it um there's been times where like I've gone and said things to people or done certain things and then when I break out of that trance I think I don't even mean what I said or I wish I never did what I did but it's scary when I'm in that trance because I feel like I have no control over my mouth and my actions I get very possessed and set on what I'm going to do wow I understand wow powerful and so it goes back to stage one again stage one is your belief system and so yeah as you said the belief system after the results is regret you feel bad about yourself and so on and so forth and then all of a sudden your belief goes back to your meaning your meaning goes back to action the action get take goes on to results the results then goes back to your belief system you know when you hear people talk about spiraling down and spiraling up yeah that's the four stages of either either spiraling down or spiraling up yeah yeah and so what we want to do is your mission and your goal right now is to work on your belief system if we readjust your belief system then the meaning of your the things that you look at would be positive the actions will be positive the results will be positive and that's the opposite way will be spiraling up does yeah. that make sense yeah yeah it does, so yeah. what we need to focus on um this evening is your belief system does that make sense yeah yeah, yeah fair it enough totally does yeah brilliant has anyone ever spoken to you about like this mindset or how how i'm describing it or talking to you about it ever before 
Uh, no, no. I mean, the only help that I've ever had was school counselling and the mind. Um, and obviously now I'm with uh, a crisis team. Mm-hmm. It's um, in Coventry, we have something across from the university hospital, main hospital. There's something called the Caledon Centre. Right. And it's um, a psychiatric hospital uh, right. for mental health patients and people that have got other mental disorders. Right. Um, and there's a team of so many people there. Mm. called the crisis team that see that will ring me daily um i will see them in appointments uh there's a place of safety um which is what i went to once when i attempted suicide for the second time uh there's trained doctors in mental health there is all sorts of things so the only help i've ever had is from them which has been for the last two months um but they've never touched this no Okay, okay. Does this make sense, what I'm talking about? Does it? Do you relate to it, or is it something that you're like, okay, I, I can get where this... I'm, I'm clicking with it, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so let's now start looking at solutions, okay? So first and foremost, we've got to work on your belief system. Now, there's certain things that's going to seem alien to you, like, I don't really believe that. And it's fine, because we're going to work it in and integrate it in. It's taken so many years for something that's not the truth to become your truth. And now we're going to do the reverse. I'm going to explain how something works first. And just tell me if you you understand or you relate to it. And I want you to remember this if you can. Okay? Okay. Here's my belief system. My belief system is I believe god is an atom okay this is what i believe i'm not saying other people do i believe god is an atom and i believe we are made from and of god so we are atoms so that means we are made from and of god okay and so that means we meant to be here this is my belief system because god has made us um, and we come from and come and, and made of god okay now when we were born we were a precious diamond yeah we were a precious diamond just the most flawless beautiful diamond and people look at this beautiful baby that's a diamond and say oh my gosh this baby is beautiful so beautiful so pure and so let's look at this baby as a diamond okay a nice big diamond okay just for a moment okay just to visualize it And then one day someone says, you're not good enough. So then what happens, forgive my French here, but what happens, shit starts to smear over the diamond. You're not good enough. You're not worthy. You're ugly. You're skinny. You're fat. You're all of these Mm -hmm. things. So shit starts to smear over the diamond. See, the diamond is who we are. The shit is who we think we are based upon what other people's been telling us. Yeah? Yeah. And so, then, what we do, we forget after a while that we are a diamond. We forget it. And we start to believe we're shit. And so, we sprinkle sprinkles over the shit to try and hide it. The clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the things we say, the things we do on social media we sprinkle shit all up we sprinkle uh sprinkles sorry all over the shit because we want to hide the shit from the world yeah but the goal is not to sprinkle anything over the shit the goal is to clean the shit away and go back to the diamond because the diamond actually sparkles more than the sprinkles but the diamond is who we are the shit is what people as smeared all over us over the years yeah your self conversation at the moment is shit but who you are is a diamond yeah is that making sense what I'm saying to you yeah it is yeah yeah I'm thinking yeah. hard about it but it does yeah 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 and I want you to definitely. just always remember that you are a diamond you're not the shit the shit is what people has been enforcing on you over the years okay yeah yeah so let's look at your 
let's let's reintroduce a belief system let's counter each one now one of them is from what i understand just correct me if i'm wrong or if i'm saying it slightly wrong just please correct me okay uh, but i'll probably like you to say it anyway one of them is that you don't feel worthy is that correct yeah yeah there's a lot of worthlessness and self-hate okay. hating myself okay. not i don't feel like i have an identity either don't that's, know who i am anymore that's fine that's fine that's fine we'll Just, find a way like over the last two months when my mental health has blew up more than it ever has mm-hmm. um things thoughts have been the worst they've ever been really like i'd never attempted suicide but in the last two months i've attempted it three times all three different ways um i've never had thoughts that i've had uh depression last month left me to a point where i could not get out of bed every day mm. it left me curled up in a ball mm. feeling that worthlessness all the time feeling everything that i said to you the worthlessness the hopelessness um the self-hate um it left me reflecting a lot as well um but yeah last month it was all the thoughts are that bad i just couldn't get out of bed i couldn't function um i wasn't drinking really i wasn't eating um my phone would ring or i'd get a text and i'd ignore it i would just be like nah completely social withdrawals i had um i didn't want to speak to anyone didn't want anybody to see me because uh my self image would upset me um I would look in the mirror for a long long time before I was to have to face anybody. Um I just couldn't function at all. Uh, to to me it seemed like a survival mode because prior to that I'd attempted my life twice and I felt like my body went into total survival mode. It was if you stay in bed, you're safe there, you're alive there. Mm. Um nothing's going to happen because the first two times were outdoors attempts. Um the first time uh things were brewing during the day it was march 11th of this year things were brewing during the day what what happened that day what what made what made um, you it was negative thoughts like really bad intrusive thoughts uh the worthlessness the self hate i was sat in front of my mirror for most of the day crying nitpicking at myself uh tearing my wardrobe apart about my clothes everything it was i felt so worthless so so worthless i felt as though i just didn't want to be here anymore all day it was like oh my god i hate myself i do not want to be here anymore but i also wanted that feeling to go and not be there anymore just as much as i didn't want to be here i wanted that feeling to die to be squashed to be gone um and then later that evening i was shown something by a friend that triggered me badly and upset me emotionally uh i don't think it was their intention to but it did can you tell me what that is what that trigger was please uh there was a relationship breakdown and somebody showed me something to do with that and uh it set my emotions off and so i decided okay the way i'll combat this is i'll go for a walk and things might be okay then so I grabbed my coat went out for a walk it was about eight o'clock at this time um and I was walking it was a long time I was out for an hour and things were just getting worse and worse and worse I was like I'm gonna go to McDonald's quickly get a drink from there take up see if it's any better I have the drink still no improvement and then my emotions started blowing up and I was like I need to get rid of this feeling now asap i can't deal with it i cannot deal with it cuz the fi- i felt that bad it was bringing me physical pain um so i was by a train station at the time and then i started planning in my head if you go to the train station and just 
throw yourself in front of the next train that comes, that feeling is dead, it is gone instantly. If you fall in front of a train, it's an instant death. There's no suffering that comes with it. Everything is so instant, it's gone. So I'll go to the train station, uh, I look at the board, trains in 10 minutes. Um, so there I am, stood over the platform, sort of like leaning forwards. I thought at the time, no one would have, there was no one there. I thought anyway, uh, I didn't think I was suspicious at the time. I thought I was just blending in because I didn't want anyone to be worried about me. I didn't want anyone to know or see what I was doing. Uh, I look at the board again, train is in five minutes. I'm still leaning over the platform. Next thing I know, there's blue flashing lights, sirens. I think nothing of it. 30 seconds later, two police officers are dragging me back saying, no, 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 you don't want to do that. You do not want to do that. Um, please come and chat to us in the back of our car. Uh, these two police officers were the best people ever. Thought, had wow. a great understanding. Wow. Brilliant understanding. Thanks it was the transport them, yeah. police. Um, so I sat in the back of their car and I literally exploded. All of my emotions just erupted. I've never cried like that, shaked like that, broke down like that in my entire life. Mm. It was everything just came out that was being suppressed all day that I was trying to combat. Um, and they, part of the protocol was, look, we have to call an ambulance and you have to go to the hospital and get the right support and go to A&E and check that you're medically okay. So I got in an ambulance and the ambulance staff were brilliant. Uh, one of the blokes was saying, I've been sat in that chair, I've been in your position, um, but we're going to get you help. So I skipped A&E when I got into hospital um, and went to something called a rapid assessment part which is full of people that need urgent assistance basically and there is one thing that I noticed when I was in there it wasn't full of people that were ill it wasn't full of people that had broken a leg or fell or anything like that it was mostly people that had attempted their life um, mostly female from when I was in there there was a girl that had to be held to the bed because she wanted to take the overdose again that didn't work, that was right next to me. Um, all kinds. Uh, I stayed overnight in the hospital and then the guys that I mentioned from the Caledon Centre came over the crisis team to see me. Uh, and then I went home and started on medication called Sertraline. Uh, Sertraline? Yeah, antidepressant and... That, that was the beginning. I was started off on 50 milligrams of that. As time went on, when I was going to my appointments, going to the Caledon Centre, it was evident the sertraline wasn't working. It's not supposed to straight away anyway. I was getting worse and worse. My moods were getting worse. I, would, I was gradually breaking down to a point where I couldn't function anymore at all. Um, the urge to want to die was getting stronger and stronger every day. Um, I had self-care started to lack. Um, everything that I had about me was lacking. It was deteriorating very quick. My mind was deteriorating very quick. Um, things that I wanted to do that were negative and urges that were negative were becoming more present. And one thing that I noticed after that day at the train station was something like never before it was a negative thing it was like you actually have the courage and the power to take your own life now mm -hmm. you've proved to yourself that you can actually do it because if the police didn't come i would have hit that train without fail, without any doubt i was like i say about the trance i get stuck in i was in that trance mm -hmm. but it also proved to me that that trance can get that bad you can take your own life so things continued to deteriorate um it was about two weeks after that the train station incident on the monday to the start of this week not this recent week but to the week i'm talking about i was planning how to end my life again um i was thinking oh the park nearby has a bridge high enough that if you jump off it your life would end i thought anyway so that was in my head a week and that week I wasn't too bad. The plan, the thought was in my head every day, but I wasn't too bad. I was functioning. Um, and it came to that Friday. 
Uh, I waited for my parents to go do shopping as they normally would on a Friday, so no one had noticed that I'd, I'd left. Uh, they left the house. I left shortly after. Was walking around the park that the bridge was nearby. Uh, I remember sitting down. I just I caught a good angle of a view, watching the view. My head was racing, just racing. Um, the worthlessness was setting in again. Uh, feeling like there was no hope. Uh, self-hate was there. Mm-hmm. Thoughts of punishment towards myself was there. Um, and then, like I said before, wanting that feeling to go and die was there. I just wanted that feeling gone as quick as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then when it started to get darker, I walked around to where the bridge was. Um, I was stood on the bridge for about 10 minutes, um, just walking back and back and forth on the bridge. Uh, just head was just racing, crying uncontrollably. Um, did, did, did you did you want, do you believe you wanted in that moment someone to save you? Did you want someone to turn up and convince you not to? Or was it like, I don't want no one here at this time. I'm going to do this. Yeah, it was like when I say I waited for my parents to leave and I waited until it was dark. It was a case of me not wanting anyone to see me, not wanting anyone to know what I was doing. It was like, I want this to happen. Um, For a long time, there was nobody that could convince me that there was a reason to live at all. I said to one of my friends the day before I went to the bridge, I said, I could chat to someone for about five hours and for that five hours they could give me reasons to live and I would walk out the chat and still think that there isn't a point in me living and I don't want to live. Yeah. So I was on that bridge and it was like I didn't want anyone to know, I didn't want anyone to see. Um, I pulled myself up and was sat on the barrier of the bridge, leaning down and I was sat there for about a minute and a half to two minutes, it wasn't long. Um, just trying to pluck up the courage to chuck myself off basically next thing I know there is a police car alongside a fire engine storming down the road it was a busy road thought nothing of it they stopped right in the middle of the road where I was pulled me down the fire crew did with a ladder Um, and then the police were like we're putting you under a section 136 which is where they detained me until I've been seen by a mental health professional Mm -hmm. to make a decision on, on me, basically, whether I'm basically safe enough to be in public or to be sectioned properly. Mm -hmm. So I stayed under the section 136 for a while, was speaking to the officers and the fire crew. They took me to the Caledon center place of safety that I mentioned. Um, And I had to go through loads of medical assessments and tests there to see if I was injured or anything or in well, which I wasn't. Um, Then I seen a team called AMHAT that came down and uh, they spoke to me. The conversation went on for an hour. And at the time, I wasn't really honest with these guys. The police were telling me, be honest, get the help. But I wasn't honest. It was about 4 a.m. I was exhausted and I just wanted to go home and go to bed at that point. Like, I was saying anything to get me out of there, to get me home, basically. I was lying to them. Um, It was like, I'm so tired. I don't want to speak to you. I've not got the energy to speak. Mm. Um, I just want to go home, go to bed. So I made up a load of rubbish, basically to make them think that I was all right, even though I knew I wasn't, just mm-hmm. so I could go home, go to bed. Mm-hmm. I had an appointment with the crisis team the next day anyway. Uh, that next day, I didn't get out of bed till about three o'clock in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. The appointment was at five. I don't think I'd have got up at all if it wasn't for the appointment. Um, and then I was still exhausted when I went to this appointment to lie to them again, uh, just because I wanted to go home and then shut off and then after that happened on the bridge, that was when my body started to shut down. That is when everything in my life started to just go. Um, that's when I said I couldn't get out of bed. From then on, I could not get out of bed. It was 
simple tasks were like impossible to me they were exhausting they were too much mm -hmm. they were overwhelming mm -hmm. like there was a mother's day card for my mom that was on my drawer of the side of the room and i was looking at it one day i was like i need to write it i need to write it i need to write it i couldn't it was like a mental block on writing it there was a mental block on doing so many simple things like showering eating drinking um, just standing up out of bed, it seemed impossible most days. Um, and like I would say this to the crisis team when they would ring and when I would see them, but I always felt like they didn't get it. I was like, you can say, oh, but you need to do that. But I was like, you don't get it. I can't physically do it. Mm -hmm. I can't bring myself to do it. Like some days it would take till six in the evening, seven in the evening till I could actually do it. And I'd go all that time without drinking or eating anything unless it was brought to me. Um, I didn't feel like people understood that. That is, I think, one of the darkest sides to mental health is that you just rot, basically. You rot. Um, and I, I remember saying to somebody, because I put a tweet out on Twitter, it was like, I'm struggling terribly. I didn't know where to turn or what to do. One day I was just spent the whole day crying. Um, and someone reached out to me and I said, I'm going to be honest with you, I would rather have like a severe case of COVID to the point that I'm hospitalised than have this. Or I'd rather go outside and take a funny step and like break my ankle or break my leg than have this. Because at because, least you know what you're pointing at, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I said to mm -hmm. them, I said, if I'm ill or if I have an illness like COVID or I've got the flu or something that's terrible. Um, I know that I can take medication. Um, there's there's medical treatment there for me. Like if you have a headache, you take aspirin. Yeah. You can get rid of it. Yeah. Mental health issues, you can take your antidepressants or you can take the antipsychotics that I'm on, but it can do nothing for you on that given day. Like I have to take lorazepam for my anxiety to sedate me from it because it can get that bad um sometimes that doesn't work but like obviously more often than not painkillers work for headaches so that's why i say i'd rather be ill or have an injury than have this because you have a recovery time then if you're to play football injure yourself you get a recovery time there's mm -hmm. a time frame mm -hmm. mental health there's no time frame mm -hmm. at all it's one thing i've noticed it um it can take some people a month and a half or so when their medication kicks in to get better mm -hmm. but for some people even when the medication kicks in they don't get better so there's no time frame um like one of the professional doctors that i've seen down the caledon center he said i'm gonna be real with you you're gonna go on these courses when the suicidal thoughts are leveled uh to retrain your brain and it can take year, a year for you to get better. It can take six months for you to get better. Mm -hmm. With mental health, there's not often a time frame. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm a person that loves certainty and loves honesty. I hate lies and I hate shiftiness. Mm. Um, so I was, behavior, yeah, 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 mm. yeah. So I was like, I'm glad that you're honest with me mm. and upfront and not telling me something that I want to hear and then doing something else behind my back i'm glad that you're being honest uh yeah I, last month april was the worst month ever i i just couldn't function it was what what so question what what triggers what do you think triggers you what triggers your anxiety or your suicidal thoughts what do you believe triggers it um so one of them you said before was um when someone's talk about relationships and yeah. so I guess there's something that's happened concerning relationships in your past that when that person showed you a video or spoke about it, it triggered something in the past, which then led to the whole slew of, of information mm. and self-conversation that led you to thinking about suicide. What, what triggers you? Um... It can be such small things. It can be, say, something bad can happen within the family, like it can with every family. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I'll blame myself. Even if it has nothing to do with me, mm. I'll blame myself. And then the suicidal thoughts come, the self-harm comes. Spiraling, right? The spiraling process. Yeah. I was okay. self-destruct, basically. Yeah. Um, most days throughout a long, long period of years, I have had um, suicidal thoughts. It has been wanting to die, saying, oh, I just want to die. I don't want to be here. But they were kind of passive at a stage where it'd be like, oh, I want to die. But, oh, tomorrow you're going to the football. You're going to watch the football. So don't die today. Yeah. Because you've got that self excuse to live another day. So yeah, you're living yeah. from moment to moment, trying to find something to hold on to just for another moment. Yeah. I mean, recently, what has kept me going is the Formula One season restarted. And I idolised Lewis Hamilton. And recently, it's been a case of, I want to die, I'll plan it. But then I'll think, oh, but you won't get to see Lewis win the race on Sunday. So it's something as simple as that that's kept me around. I think that's, I, I think that's good. That's a good thing. That's a good yeah. thing. Okay, all right, so let's look at this first and foremost because I, I understand and we are, is it going to be a hard journey? Yes, it is, as you already know. I'm not trying to tell you anything you don't know already, but yeah. is it possible you can turn it around? 100% yes, definitely can turn it around. I can tell you that for a fact. It's going to take time, it's going to take a team of people and I'm going to explain what those team, team of people are going to be there for um, and I'm happy to help you away from here as well so it's, it's not just about what we're doing right now I'm happy yeah. to help I don't want to just do this with you and then I never speak to you again because it's going yeah. to play it's going to play on me forever so I'm going to definitely help you away from here what we need to do first and foremost is work on your belief system yeah but yeah I this, think that is a big part yeah yeah massive part but also as well, there's other parts of it. I don't know if everyone's, anyone's ever said this to you, but we have to also work on your belief system. We have to work on your diet. Has anyone ever said you need to work on your diet before? Yeah, I mean, um, like I said last month, I was in a low functioning stage um, where diet would sometimes vary from eating absolutely nothing to if something was brought to me, I'd eat it all in one go. And what um, kind of what kind of stuff do you normally eat on a normal um, day? Over the last five years, diet hasn't been great. Um, it would dip between good some weeks, but then it would go bad again. Just would wouldn't be able to keep up with a good diet. Or, what kind What kind of foods do you eat? Um, now I've started a good diet. I've gone back to boxing again, which is something that I used to enjoy just on the bag for now uh, so there's a lot of exercise a lot of sweat there I love that um, like yesterday I went and it was like I sweated that much I don't think I've ever sweat that much in my life uh, so it's been a lot of uh, speed food for me recently that I've been trying to have um, as, alongside protein trying to keep that balance because as a PE teacher I know what you need and what you don't need mm -hmm. so but previous years there was a lot of self-neglect uh where it was takeaway food because it was easier um yeah. because i would get that exhausted with my mind it would just be that that was easier that didn't require any energy i didn't have to cook that i didn't have to spend time cooking that and then washing up after it would be easy um, and then throughout the day, because I couldn't, I just didn't have the energy to make something for the next day at work. I'd have something unhealthy, like chocolate, sweets, fizzy drinks. And no one needs to tell me the bad effect that that has on you as someone that's yeah, studied the, yeah. the You know it physical. logically, but emotionally, in, in those moments, it, it goes out the window, right? Yeah, it does, yeah. When you're that drained, by the way, that you are mentally... It's hard to keep a good diet mm, because a lot of the time when I would come home from work, I would just crash in my bed because the mental, daily mental tasks that I'd have would physically exhaust me. Like when people say, 
they're mentally exhausted. They're not just mentally exhausted. It becomes physical as well. Yes, yes. It comes to a point the where they are physically so tired. Um, it's like uh, tonight, the plan was to go to the gym earlier in the day, but I couldn't because I'd had a rough morning and I was mentally exhausted from it. Mm. And I needed time to relax because if I went to the gym, I wouldn't be able to function this evening at all. I would be so tired, I wouldn't be able to lift my head off the pillow. I've had days like that where I've been that mentally exhausted, lifting my head off the pillow. It's like it comes up and then it goes straight back down. I'm that mm. tired. That was mainly last month when I went through the whole shutdown phase that I was in. Right, so let, let, let's talk about the depression just for a second. Um, I just want to point out something to you. I'm not sure if you've been told this before. So how does how does it affect your brain? Um, depression, you've got, you know about inflammation, right? So you have inflammation yeah. on, you know, if you was to bruise your, your, your hand or you was to cut yourself, your, um, your cell and your skin starts to protect itself and then you'll get like inflammation on the, yeah. yeah? What happens, depression causes inflammation on the brain. Okay. And so when you have inflammation on the brain, that is depression. We needed stress in the days of fight and flight. We needed it, you know, if there was some form of saber-toothed tiger or whatever it may be coming to attack us, we needed to have that moment of genuine rush um, in order to protect ourselves. Okay, we would run faster than normal because the stress levels goes up or we'll fight the tiger or whatever it may be. So it's like fight or flight, right? Mm. So we're not designed to have stress for long periods of time. Now, what is stress? Stress should normally last about hours. Yeah, maximum yeah. a day, but it should never be more than a matter of hours because that's the moment of fighting the tiger or hiding from the tiger or running for your life. And what's happened over time is the stress has continued for weeks and then the stress of it causes inflammation on the brain which then causes depression and so as i talk about diet because i'm jumping back and forth a bit as i'm talking about diet we also need to look at anti-inflammatories to deal with the depression on the brain so the anti-inflammatories are things like fish oil fish oils and stuff like that yeah mm. um so we need to set up certain supplements to to deal with the inflammation on the brain and so we'll be fighting it from many different angles so we're going to work on your belief system which then deals with the past we're going to deal with the diet which deals with the body and the healthy mind we're going to deal with certain um uh, supplements etc which will deal with the inflammation on the brain. So for example, certain fish oils, there's a thing called St. John's wort. These are all natural stuff. St. John's wort, um, which will deal with that, which directly deals with depression. This, this is all herbs and stuff like that and mm -hmm. uh, supplements. Um, and there's one also called um, passion flower. And so all of these things will deal with your moods and depression, etc. So what we need to do we need to fight it from many different angles. There's no one particular way, okay? And yeah. so, as I said, what we need to work on is your new founded belief system. And so we need to work on your belief system of purpose. We need to uh, deal with, um, and purpose will deal with hopelessness. When you find your purpose, then it will automatically by default deal with your hopelessness. We also need to deal with your self conversation of punishing yourself and the punishing yourself as i said where i've got an idea but i'm not going to address it because you don't want to talk about certain things so i'm, mm. I'm going around in circles in a sense you'll understand i would understand okay yeah. you need to deal with a process of forgiveness self-forgiveness but also forgiveness for another person or another two or another three people or the others so you need to forgive yeah. both now forgiving the other side is not because you're doing them a favor it's because you're releasing yourself from that 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 detachment 
and forgiving yeah. yourself is forgiving yourself and allowing yourself to be a human being at the moment you're punishing yourself for many different reasons it's my fault maybe i shouldn't have been there at that time maybe i shouldn't have this and so on and so forth so we need to deal with the process of forgiveness as well and we'll put i'm going to away from here put a system together for you yeah okay. so you give me a few days i'm gonna put a system together the things to take the things to do i wish you was in london so if you was in london i'll grab you by the collar and we'll be working together you know? <laughs> um and so i'm going to be working on the trauma center soon anyway so hopefully i'll get this trauma center open but you'll be you'll be fine by then but in the future i'll have a trauma center so people can come in and i'll work on them daily they'll stay over at night and all the rest of it so we need to deal with that side and what we need to do as well we need to have what i call an accountability partner for you so have you heard of accountability partner before no okay See, here's the thing. At this precise time, you're doing it all by yourself. I mean, yes, you've got support around you and your people who love you, but we need to have a, an accountability partner in place for you that when you wake up in the morning, if something needs to be done, that person's going to hold you to account. At the moment, you're your own accountability partner and you well, that's not a good idea at times because you just can't be asked. Sometimes you can't be asked, sometimes you don't want to and so on and so forth. So when you have an accountability partner, that person holds you to account and they say like, Tom, this is what you've got. Remember, you've got to do this at six o'clock or you've got to do this at nine o'clock. And so what happens, it will go from, I don't want to do it. You're getting on my nerves. Leave me alone to, I want to do it. Because before you was forced into doing certain things, like when you was going to school, you didn't want to be there and so on and so forth until you broke into a pattern. Now we need to bring someone else in to help you break into a new pattern mm. yeah does that make sense yeah. yeah yeah it does yeah yeah how does it sound to you so far it sounds good to me yeah yeah it sounds good i mean obviously there's work there's self-conversation and all the rest of it so we need to put things in place so let's start with stage one um and we, we obviously we can't do this all in a day it's impossible to do it all in a day but as long as i just get you to say it's possible that's for me success for the day that would be i would imagine success for both of us the fact that it's possible and yet i can see myself doing it yeah so so stage one is your belief system as we spoke about before okay so if you can yeah. write this down and let's work on the belief system together first and foremost we need to we, we need to to work on your belief that you have a purpose in this world okay yeah. all right and so purpose sure. what is it that we believe you can do in this world that will give massive value in this world believe it or not at this precise time you're helping what age group are you doing PE with uh, it's primary school years so uh, it's from about 4 years old to 11 ok 4 years old to 11 do you believe you're helping them for the best? When I'm in a bad headspace, I believe that I shouldn't be teaching them. But some days when I'm really, really, really bad, I believe I'm the last person that should be teaching them. But on other days that I'm coping or stable enough to function, um, I believe that, yeah, I am helping them and that they will progress. Um, also, in terms of purpose, I've been thinking recently that I don't want to go through this experience and then be like at the end of it, well, yeah, I experienced that. It gets better. End of. To someone else that's suffering. Like I want to be in a position where I can help other people from what I've experienced. I love that. So, I love so, that. It's like, I don't want to go through it for no reason. Like, I don't want it to get better and be like, oh, yeah, I went through that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I want to actually be able to be educated enough to be in a position where if someone else is going, what I'm going through, or someone else is going through something similar or a hard time, that I can actually help them get through it and see the other side to it. I think that's powerful. Absolutely powerful. So there's two sides we're seeing of this now and what to do with your purpose so let's write this down your mission 
is to help build and empower people. Yeah. Yeah. What can we do in order for you to help build and empower people? Um, I can raise as much awareness as I can by being open about the things that I've been through. I love that. Um, I was even thinking because Coventry University is a very good university uh, thinking of studying mental health nursing there mm-hmm. when I'm when I'm better to maybe go into it as a job because my problem is is that I've seen people that are mental health professionals mm-hmm. and I think a lot of the time any one random person off the street could tell me what they've told me. Um, they have, they clearly haven't been through any mental difficulty, mm. um, and it's all cliche stuff. Yeah. And there's been times where I've come out of um, sessions where I felt significantly worse. There is two that I can pinpoint. The first one was just an appointment with a crisis team. Um, and they just kept saying to me, you just got to keep going. You just got to keep going. It's almost condescending, right? Yeah, yeah. And And, patronising. And I was like, do you think I haven't told myself that? Do you think I haven't thought that I need to keep going? Or do you think that someone else hasn't told me that, that you need to keep going? Yeah. Like, it is patronising. It it was the worst feeling ever, and I felt very suicidal coming out of that. Wow, wow. Um, that meeting with them I was like I could lit I was getting the bus home and I was like I could literally just throw myself in front of that bus right now instead of actually getting on it they made me feel that bad wow luckily that didn't happen yeah. um I came home and ended up falling asleep that day there was a second time as well um and these people are supposed to help and make decisions on people's mental health it's a team called Amhat in Coventry now this was going back to my third suicide attempt, which was an overdose at the end of April last month. Mm-hmm. That came about because when I said to you I wasn't functioning at all, um, I was like, I can't do this anymore. That is it. Can not do this every day, all day. I was like, the moment that I wake up in the morning, it is on me. I don't get a minute or two to wake up and gather my thoughts. It is bang is straight on me to the moment that I somehow fall asleep I was like I can't do this I physically cannot do it Mm -hmm. so what was happening was I started stockpiling my antidepressants because I talked about overdose before so all the painkillers in the house were hidden from me so I started stockpiling my antidepressants that they were giving me Um, I ended up with 15 of my sertraline in the end and I swallowed all of them one after the other sat on my bed kept going uh for about 15 minutes i felt nothing like nothing had changed in me um and then i came out of that trance that i said i w- i'll go into and i was like oh no so i told dad who then said you need to ring the caledon center the crisis team now so i rang them and they were like well you need an ambulance don't you like we can't do anything for you at the minute whilst you've took that right so an ambulance comes out uh they take my ecg readings they said these are far too high um so i had to go into hospital i had to eat this thing that they call charcoal it was like that it tasted the most disgusting thing that you could ever put in your mouth <laughs> but, yeah, apparently, yeah, but, yeah. but apparently it was uh it it all breaks down what you've took it tries right. to get it out of your system tries to flush it out um i was in hospital uh they were doing my ecg readings and now i was hooked up and i was deteriorating really fast like my heart was um was erratic basically it was going from low beats per minute that was critical to 170, 180, 190 beats per minute. They were like getting me prepared for a cardiac arrest. That's what they thought I was going to have. Um, my legs were shaking uncontrollably. Uh, body movements were terrible. Uh, I was vomiting. Um, and then eventually when things started to stable down, 
they were saying like you've got to have blood tests and now one thing that comes with my anxiety is needle phobia so I then had a panic attack on the floor in front of the doctor I was screaming uh, vision was blurred I thought I was going to die in that moment that's usually what happens when you have a panic attack anyway um, yeah, yeah. I feel like you have a heart start attack right yeah yeah it was like I was just screaming help because I thought I was actually going to die on that floor um, and then I vomited and snapped out of it and I was drenched in sweat but obviously as the panic attack had happened they could take the blood test they could put the cannula in they said we're going to have to keep you in um, we're going to have to pump you with fluids because your liver is damaged your kidney is damaged and we think that your heart is now damaged uh, so I had to stay in for monitoring and further tests. Uh, and a lot changed in me when I was in hospital then. Um, I was trying to build up loads of mental strength. I was talking more than ever. More than ever, I was talking to friends, family, everyone. I was so open about what I'd how, done. How, how, how did it make you feel when you were talking and, and expressing and sharing? It didn't make me feel anything, but what I felt the night that I went in in the ambulance and my health was deteriorating, I was scared. I, excuse my French, absolutely shit myself. No, no, it's Basically, fine, it? absolutely was petrified of what I'd done. I was like, what on earth have I done? I've really messed myself up. The nurses were like, the side effects of overdoses are that they can affect your health for the rest of your life. Like, you can have health conditions for the rest of your life. Um, like, they can do seriously bad things to you. Um, I was like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And everyone was telling me, like, please don't do that again. Um, I was like, I, I won't at the time. I was building up a lot of mental strength, talking. I was trying to get up in the morning in the hospital to have a shower. Um, because I was like saying the patients around me were actually even trying to help me. They seen how bad I was. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were like, it's brilliant. You're actually getting up in the morning for the first time and having a shower. Because the first day in there, I remember saying to the nurse, I said, this is the first time I've had a shower in the morning for about a month, I think. Mm-hmm. It would always come very late in the evening if, if I actually did it. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, it's not massive progress, but it's a start. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, a few days in there. Um, and uh, they, when they medically discharged me, they were like, because you're under a section at the minute, we can't discharge you. Yeah, yeah. How long so, was it? Was it 28 days or? It was, um, I was in there for four days. Right. Um, but they were like, you either, when you've been assessed by this AMHAT team, they will either discharge you or you'll get admitted to the Caledon Centre which across the road, which is the mental health hospital. Yeah. Um, where I would be placed in the resection of 28 days they said if that happens uh at that time it was 72 hours and then an extra 24 hours was put on top of it so the amhat team come down um i speak to them and it was the worst conversation i think i've ever had with another human being in my life wow in what sense okay it was patronizing it was Mm. basically a mockery based Mm. basically uh, completely disregarding the way that I'd felt, everything that I'd been through, totally discarded everything. It was basically like, okay, you feel bad, but someone's always got it worse, so yeah, it doesn't I matter hate that. because of someone's got it worse. And I was like, how? I was thinking to myself, how as a professional are you saying that to me? How mm. can you say that? Like, um, I remember the conversations that was going on. I stopped responding. I was like, I just want to get out of here because I can't listen to you any longer Mm -hmm. um they kept telling me they were like yeah you've got it hard but i had to still come into work whilst covid was going on you got no kidding me yes they were saying that they were saying you've had it bad but you were furloughed so you're all you was all right i still had to come into work not knowing if i was bringing this virus back home to to my family i was like what has that got to do with anything that doesn't make any sense it has nothing to do with this wow Um, wow and what was that person? Is that was that person a, a counselor or a psychologist or 
It was supposed to be a professional that made a decision on whether I could get discharged mentally or sectioned. Um, so, yeah, they were supposed to make referrals for me as well. They made none. Um, the conversation was terrible. They were like, just think of yourself as a brand new Mercedes Benz and you never stop going. Because if I was to buy an old car, it would probably break down. I was like, again, that makes no sense. That is... Wow. That is that is nothing to me like and they were saying you have it worse but say if someone um had cancer they'd be worse off than you i said <laughs> how can they say that this is ridiculous <laughs> yes yes this is this is honest truth honest honest truth and um i was sat there in disbelief didn't know what to say after that um well and they were like uh wasn't really writing anything down as they were supposed to or yeah. talking to me about my feelings. It was all about how my feelings are invalid. Someone's always got it worse, basically. Get lost. They said, we don't need to section you. We don't need to admit you to the Callison Centre. I'm happy to let you go. And I said at the end, I said, what about referrals, about the trauma that I'd mentioned that I'd only just about been able to mention? And they were like, no, no need for that. You can wow. get this charge. You can go home. And I was like, I came out of that and I was crying. I went back to my hospital bed and the patients were like, what the hell has happened? Like, I said, they've just totally discarded the way I felt. Just made it sound like it's nothing because someone's always got it worse. Um, I just wanted to get out of the hospital at that point, go home. That's, that's, I'm pissed to hear that, to be honest yeah. with you. I'm I, really said, I remember... Off. When I was speaking to my dad about it on the way home, I said, if I hadn't built up any mental strength over these last couple of days and talked as much as I had, um, researched as much as I had, listened to as, the amount of podcasts that I had, uh, like Tyson Fury listening to him speak, mm. it was very empowering to me. Yeah. Um, just good, research. Yeah. I didn't use my time in hospital to rot. I used tried to be productive with it. And educate myself i said if i didn't do that that conversation that i just had could have killed me wow and i said i'm concerned that someone else could be yeah worse off than me or feel the same as me or even not be as bad yeah. as me and that conversation with that particular person could kill someone it could literally make them feel 10 times worse the suicidal thoughts could be even worse the urge to want to end everything could be even worse if someone else had that conversation with that person that day so i'm gonna i'm As... gonna ask you a question right it's gonna be a very very powerful question do you believe you could have done a better job than that person yes yeah okay i believe that my 11 year old brother could have done a better job than that person no but, but right now do you believe you could have done a better job 100%. I could have even probably made referrals to someone, I believe, in the right places. So, here's the thing. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to put this back to you. That person's in a position of power, probably getting paid loads of money, probably whatever it may be, right? And you've just said that you've got more value on this planet doing that job than that person. Do you remember before you said you don't believe you've got feel, feeling worthlessness? You've just stated just now, if you was in that person's position, you would have saved someone's life. Yeah. I believe even when I'm in one of my worst states, I could do a better job than that person. Well, let's prove it. Let's put you in that position by helping, building, empowering people. Let's put that forward. You up for that? yeah 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 okay so what we should do we should get you talking to people put put you in a position of purpose put you in a position that you know you know what so many millions and millions of people are and have experienced you know what they go through you know how to talk to them you know how to help them get to the next stage you yeah. know what, what everything, what they're going through, what they're probably about to do, what they've just done. You know when they're lying to themselves. You know when they're lying to others. You know. Yeah. So all we need to do is get you into a place where you truly believe it 
and you have the tools to not just help others but to help yourself as well yeah yeah definitely does that sound like a plan yeah it does yeah because i mean yeah. like i say I, I never wanted to just get over this experience and then that be it with it i wanted to use it as a tool to help others in the future and and just be honest be honest with me and be honest with yourself do you really want to die that's a difficult question it's something that i struggle to answer a lot of the time because but how about right now right now no no but so let's deal my... with right now every right now if that makes yeah. sense right yeah. now no let's work with that because here's yeah. the thing i think there's been a time in most of our lives where we all just wanted to just die but in the but what right now where we are we don't yeah okay so let's just deal with your right now and so right now it's a no and maybe one hour right now we can then say it again an hour from now do i really want to do it no okay cool an hour from then right now maybe i do okay how can i tackle that but let's deal with the right now because what your mind is doing is searching for a moment to you remember i said seek an experience mm. and so do you like reading books or do you like doing any of those things i like watching podcasts that's okay, I, I really want you enjoy. to study a guy called Echo Tori because he, he wrote a book called The Power of Now. And and so The Power of Now is, is partially about being in the moment. And so just kind of YouTube Echo Tori, uh, The Power mm -hmm. of Now, and you'll see some stuff on it. Um, because I want you to just stay in the moment of the now more than it racing around. So what, we're, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a system together because I said there's no way one session today is going to cover, fix, find a solution. It's just, it's not going to happen realistically. But we can, I'm going to put a system together for you. You'll have it within the next two to three days. And what, what a part of that system is to also have an accountability partner. I would like you to contact a couple people uh, and ask them do you mind if you can be my accountability partner and all okay. the, the the role of the accountability partner is just going to simply hold you to account for the things that you're going to set tasks goals missions um, achievements they're going to hold you to account for that yeah and yeah. so you're not being a burden on them absolutely if, if anything it's the opposite you're now giving them a position to play a powerful positive position in your life so now you're saying for example listen i want to study this particular thing can you please just make sure and hold me to account that when i say no they're gonna say listen stop fucking about <laughs> yeah you go and focus on that today because your mind is gonna say no because your mind wants to stay where your mind wants to stay but what we're gonna do as you said we need to rewire um your thought process your mindset your belief system and it's gonna fight it's gonna fight like hell but in return, your network around you is going to fight until it falls in line. So yeah. that's the goal and the mission. So as I said, what I'm going to put together first is going to be your, um, your the first thing I'm going to work on. I'm not going to work on um, your actions yet. I'm going to work on your belief system. So I'm going to put some stuff together for you and I'm going to send it over to you. Then we'll have some conversations about it. Um, and then we're going to work on your self-talk, your self-conversation. So as I said, the four stages is your belief system, the meaning you give to things, the actions you take, the results you get, which then reinforces your belief system. So we need to get the belief system right first. Then mm -hmm. we can work on your self-conversation. Because at the moment, we've worked on like, okay, we've recognized you can do a better job than, than people who are in a position and they shouldn't be in a position. So we know one of... Um, your belief is your belief system. You believe you can do better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So now let's put a, something together that's going to prove that you can do better, and it's going to make you feel good about yourself. It's going to make you have a good self conversation. Okay. Wow. I've done something today which is better. And so we need to put that in place. The the second thing we need to put in place 
in, in no particular order is a system a self-system of reassurance and forgiveness and so we need to put all these things together so i'm gonna as i said i'm gonna put a, a list together we'll go over the list to, together you may add some you may say i'm not comfortable with that one can we just adjust it around and if it's something that can be adjusted great if not and it needs to be there i may push you a bit and urge you a bit because at times you're not gonna like me <laughs> yeah at times you're gonna be like <laughs> kev is an arsehole but <laughs> the arsehole kev in those moments will get you to a place where you're gonna feel better then we're gonna work on your um, supplements and diets and so as i said uh, st john's wort passion flower um fish oils will deal with inflammation on the brain and your moods as well and as i said inflammation in the brain is depression and so we're going to work on certain things and they're all natural as well so the side effects no need to worry they are really good and i'll find some other stuff as well and so whilst we're working on different parts to deal with bringing down the inflammation on your brain we'll be working on your belief system and some other stuff yes you're gonna have low days yes you're gonna be fighting at times you're gonna go through like a psychological cold turkey however i do honestly believe and i'm not just saying it i'm not just blowing smoke up your ass or anything like that i do honestly believe you can turn this around now what do we know we know it's a bit like alcohol you have to always be very careful not to dance with 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 depression or to do certain things so for example and what i mean by that i give you an example is what do you watch on tv what are you going to listen to on radio or what do you play in your in your um, in your headphones or whatever it may be on your phone all of those things have to be managed because they can trigger stuff so okay. watching something on tv that's negative it can trigger so we have to be very consciously aware about the things you watch the things you talk about the things you listen to they all have to be managed because they all can kind of change the dynamics of the way you're looking at yourself or looking at the world like for example talking about covid too much affects so many people and then all of a sudden it turns into another place so we have to manage your intake of information conversation music tv and so on and so forth does that make sense yeah yeah it does yeah definitely okay. uh, has anyone ever spoken to you about that before the, the no intake? it's it's never really come across my mind either it's yeah. never something that has been there with me at all like i've never seen that as a potential trigger or something that could harm someone yeah and and does um, it make sense now that we've spoken about it it does yeah it does massively yeah um like there's a pattern to like music that i listen to in certain moods what do you listen to uh i listen to drill rap hip-hop and then house music alongside that and you know they are major triggers for depression right and anger and frustration like the drill is something that triggers frustration yeah yeah and so once again they are all a part of um the direction of going into a deep dark depression all of it and so mm. what we're gonna do what we're gonna do as well we're gonna do another session next week if you want to and it's yeah. going to be offline. It's going to be just me and you, no cameras, no nothing, because I really want to drill into you, using the term, forgive the pun. Um, but I really want to drill into you um, a whole new system. So what we're going to do, the plan is, first and foremost, I want to know your daily routine. And I know it kind of it fluctuates and it differs based upon your moods, but we'll find a pattern. And so I want to know your daily routine, hour to hour, and then what we're going to do is start adjusting that daily routine. Yeah. And so instead of you doing this, we're going to do that instead. And then I want to um, look at the things that's in your surroundings. So when you're at home, we need to look at the frequency of what's in your house. What triggers in your house? Are there pictures? Are there certain type of clothing? We need to look at every little thing. And so once again, there are triggers that could be in your house. We could be walking around. You could be looking around your house. Or you could walk past a picture or you could walk past even a color and that could be a trigger so we need to look at the frequency as well 
of what's going on in your house. So when we're working on that side, um, yeah. and and once again, we're, we're you know we're not once again. We're also going to be looking at um, conversations with other people. For example, you may have someone that pisses you off every time they message you or talk to you. So once again, we're going to have to limit those kind of things as well. It's gonna. It's, it sounds very strict, but we know. Uh, your your emotional and mental challenges is ruthless so we have to be ruthless in return yeah yeah yes i so mean what... there is there's always there's one thing last week that happened with uh people that i talked to that yeah. trigger me uh there's one person that is going through a pretty rough time themselves mm -hmm. um but they know there is a they know the trigger and it is disposable but they won't dispose of the trigger. And I gave all the help that I could give. And it was still negativity. They were texting me with negativity all day, every day. And I noticed that it was affecting my mood. Yeah. So I just said, I give up. I'd give up. I said, I've helped you as much as I can. Gave as much advice as there is for me to give. I give up. I can't deal with the negativity all day. With the way that I'm feeling at the minute. Um, it's bringing me down and halting my recovery your negativity now that may sound horrible, harsh but when you say about the ruthlessness to my mental illness basically that was me being ruthless to combat something that was daily bringing my mood down which was negativity that I was receiving every day well I I'm going to explain something to you and I want you to, I like to explain the science of things so people can kind of take it away and remember it themselves. Yeah. Um, remember I said we're electrons? Yeah? yeah. And we're protons and we're neutrons, okay? When you're in an electron zone, you're in a negative zone. And so that means other electrons like connecting with it. Have you ever, ever, ever heard the term before, misery loves company? yeah yeah so frequency loves frequency so a negative frequency loves a negative frequency and so you look at bonding and connecting based upon a negative frequency but as soon as you you wanted to move from an electron zone to a proton zone they try to pull you back down into that frequency and so you can't help that person because you're in the same frequency as them yeah 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 and so definitely you, you cannot feel bad because you need to get out of that frequency and the only way you're going to get out of that frequency is by focus on the proton tone uh, proton zone which is more positive two electrons can't dance together and move to protons they you need you need intervention from a proton zone does that make sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay and so what we're going to do we're going to as i said implement protons from all different angles in your world as i said from supplements self-conversation looking at belief system um i've got a list right here by the way so that's why i'm always looking down because i'm writing things down i've got a <laughs> list right here by the way of all the things that i'm gonna um, introduce to you um from exercise building your dreams resting prayers and affirmation um, and reading psalms and stuff like that eating the right food laughter and smiling i know that must be hard but like do you do you watch and do you listen to comedy and things like that um well i can tell you no no <laughs> because once again they're, they're proton activities and so okay. we need to introduce i'm not saying you don't watch comedy every now and then but it's not a part of your habitual it's mostly football, boxing, UFC. Yeah, it's uh, all aggressive stuff. Yeah, Mo yeah. Yeah, it's all aggressive stuff. And so we need to introduce new things in your world that's a bit more, as I said, happy, upbeat. Because UFC is war. Boxing is war. Yeah. Um, and I love them, but they're war. And so yeah. when you're in that, that state, it's, it, you're just it. It's, it's, a, it's a frequency of expression. So you're watching it and you're like, yep, knock him out, this, that. And it's like, ah, 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 ah. 
It's aggression, aggression, and aggression, and aggression, and aggression. And then football, football, you're so passionate about football. You're like, come on! And so it's more aggression. Yeah? And so yeah. You, you have moments of release in those moments, but then it goes back inside of you again and you become more frustrated and angry and anxious and so on and so forth. So we need to introduce new things into your world. Yeah, mm -hmm. new tools. It's funny you say that as well, because like when I started to notice back in January that my mental health was deteriorating was after a match of football. My team had lost and I took it the worst I think I'd ever took a loss. Now, bear in mind, I've seen us get battered in cup finals. <laughs> you, you can't um, be talking about Arsenal, right? <laughs> No, <laughs> I've I'm, a, I'm an Arsenal supporter, and, and and yeah, it affects my moods. Yeah, like the battering came from Arsenal in the cup final. Oops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I've seen us lose playoff finals. Um, yeah. I've seen us get relegated on 17 points, mm. but that never triggered me like I was triggered by this one match against Burnley in January, right. I lost my head. I punched the hole in my wardrobe. Wow. I threw all of my body sprays, the urgent aftershaves off my drawer, threw my fan across my bedroom. I went on Twitter and started arguing with people that didn't agree with my opinion straight away, but harshly. Mm. I was in a rage. Wow. And I woke up the next day apologize to people that I'd said things to because mm -hmm. I'm not a person that ever means anyone else harm yeah. but um, in that moment was, yeah I was mm -hmm. reflecting the next day and I was like that is so embarrassing like mm -hmm. there is something wrong here like you've never reacted like that before like I've walked out of Wembley Stadium before heartbroken when we lost the Fulham in a playoff final mm -hmm. I've walked out of an FA Cup final heartbroken I walked out of the Carabao Cup final last season when we lost to Man City heartbroken mm -hmm. but so you can one... see how it's affecting you right yeah yeah like although that heartbreak I would always say oh but I had a good day out of the game so the match doesn't matter because I had a great day out with friends great mm. day out it's just brilliant but like that one game against Burnley in January there has never been a reaction like that no mm. one should react like that to a football match no one should come to a point where they're smashing their bedroom up and breaking their own belongings yeah. over a game of football it should not happen yeah. because that game didn't define any part of our season it didn't mm. relegate us it didn't get us into Europe it wasn't defining a trophy or anything it was just a league game against Burnley but mm. we'd lost and there was never any frustration like that on my part before. I've coached kids football. We've lost games where I've been frustrated with myself. Never reacted like that. Um, yeah, like in terms of football, I've seen it all. And there's never been a reaction like that in my life from it. Because clearly it wasn't about the game, right? It was about you. Yeah, and that was the first time I noticed that there was something wrong with me. But I tried to suppress it because where I was at the time I didn't want to admit it mm. I didn't want to show it and I thought that it would bring more negativity and hassle my way if I spoke out and said this is how I'm, I'm suffering basically my moods are low they're erratic I'm suffering I need help but I thought certain people that I had around me at the time like they usually did would have reacted negative towards it and would not have helped the situation at all um, so I, I just tried to mask it, keep a lid on it, um, suppress it as much as I could. And it was hard because I would be around them at weekends and I wouldn't be able to get out of bed until one, two in the afternoon because it would be dread towards the next week. I could be Saturday and I'd be like in bed at one o'clock in the afternoon because I would be dreading the next week. It was like, oh my God, I just have no motivation because of the lowness and the dread. Um, and then I remember the game after that, I was watching it with them. I think we played Leeds. We won though, strangely enough. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was like saying to myself all game, 
like stay calm stay calm stay calm because Tyrone Mings he plays for us and he triggers me terribly because he's so error prone it gets on my nerves <laughs> um, so yeah I was like if he makes a mistake just breathe uh, one, my one friend that in a friendly manner we wind each other up about the football yeah I found myself getting aggressive with him in past weeks if things weren't going my team's way mm-hmm. um like I'd be nasty to him basically and it wasn't on I have apologised um, like I was like ignore him if he messages just ignore ignore try and suppress everything that triggered you in the last game but someone shouldn't be watching a game of football and feeling like that there's blatantly something wrong with someone if they're feeling like that yeah I agree but I've never had anger I've never had anger issues in my life mm. um, I've seen people and been close to people that have had them and I've always said to myself I will never ever get to that state yeah, and as a teacher you have to have all the patience in the world anyway mm. um, like there can be so many challenging children or day to day challenges and you need to have the most patience anyone could ever imagine being a teacher mm-hmm. because it's every day is different every child's different mm. they have all different needs um, so yeah patience and calmness has always been a big thing about me but mm. Yeah. At the in start of yeah, yeah. And, at the and start, what, what it is, it's, it's because you've been compressing so much inside of you that you may point at the game as the reason, but it could have been anything. It could be someone sneezing. It would have, it would have, it would have been that explosion because it's been building up so, so long inside of you. So, so this is what we're gonna do, right? I'm gonna put a program together, and. Yeah. If you give me about three days um, offline, I'm going to give you my phone number. And you give me about three days, we're going to start putting a program together. And then we start the journey. Okay. Yeah. Um, does it sound like a plan? It sounds like a plan I'm, I'm happy yeah. to go with, yeah. Brilliant. And so, just a question for you. Coming on this evening and we're getting ready to come off now how is there a difference how do you feel how did you feel um, before how do you feel now is there any difference not really or feel better or how do you feel prior to this i was like if this was this time last week i would not have been able to do it mm-hmm. um knowing that it was getting put out and it was being recorded i was like absolutely no chance yeah uh, but because I noticed that I'm coming to a higher functioning level of depression, because there's two, you have low functioning, high functioning, mm-hmm. it's becoming higher, I've been able to do it. Um, at the start, there was still that weight of hopelessness on me. Yeah. Like when the doctors would ask me at the hospital, do you see any hope? Do you feel any hope? And I'd say, no, there is none for me at mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. Because there wasn't a plan. Mm-hmm. There was nothing. It was just... Here's more antidepressants. Here's more antipsychotics. Or oh, if mm-hmm. that don't work, we'll up your dosage. We'll up it again and again and again. And it was a plan that I was never comfortable with in the first place, mm-hmm. medication. Yeah. Um, so this has made me feel like, okay, someone is taking their time to help me. Mm-hmm. That makes me feel like I'm worth something at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and that plan is something that I look forward to seeing. So there is hope in that sense and something Brilliant. to hold on to. That, that's all I ask from you is just to give me a moment to help with the hope. You yeah. Know? Um, and I won't let you down. I'll give you my word and I'm going to stick to my word. And so I appreciate me, it. No, no, no. Like you deserve so much in your life. You deserve it. And we're going to find that. We're going to find, we're going to discover so much on that journey. Um, so yeah, give me a few days. I'm gonna put a system together. I've got tons of information. I've been writing on even. I've got. I need to be writing on this. I've been writing on everything. <laughs> my hands on. I even got a bit more that I was jotting. In. So every time you saw me looking down, I was actually writing away. And then I've got my laptop here, and I was actually researching as well. So if you saw me typing on my laptop, I was actually researching some of the medication. Um, that you were um, discussing and talking about as well so I've, I've yeah. just really been kind of like in my little world here just zoning in alright mm. so what we're going to do we're going to jump offline I'm going to talk to you I'm going to continue talking to you once I've just finished recording 
and then we will go from there yeah yeah okay